Man, as we're moving into this exciting time and season, boy, that, it's got me pretty fired up. We're going back and looking at old videos and stuff. We're going to show you a video next week, and you, I got to set it up before you do, when I, even before they show it, probably. You can't get caught up in the fact that I really had hair back then, <laughs> and I was skinny. But my accent, you think I have an accent now? Y'all ain't heard nothing yet, I'm just telling you. I don't think I ever said anything with two syllables the whole service. Everything, I, it could have been it, and it was four syllables. It was like so slow. <laughs> nothing wrong with it. Proud of my heritage. Amen. I just don't want you to be shocked. Praise God. But it was only 16 years ago, I think it was. But part of what we'll show you is uh, we had just gotten in this building, and that's when God gave me the two streams vision. He gave me the two streams vision in 04, while we were at Steph's mom and dad's for uh, Christmas, as I was preparing my heart to uh, deliver our New Year's Eve service message, which is always a message of vision. And uh, I was sitting around midnight, you know, you got to wait for the little kids to go to bed and relatives go to bed so you can get along with God. And I was doing that each night coming up to the time before we would leave. And uh, that's when God dropped in my spirit the mission of my life would be bringing two streams together, integrity and faith in God's word and demonstration and manifestation of his glory. Glory, doxa, splendor, brightness, shining. Presence, being seen, to make God seen. Not only to make God heard, but to make God seen. How? Through salvations and baptisms of the Holy Spirit, through healing and deliverance and setting people free. Today, I'm going to continue on and talk to you about legendary legacy. I shared with you last week from my heart, I'm not going to get into massive detail this week about what God has asked us to do as a church. You know, God gave us the vision this year for 2024 is a year of invitation. Somebody say invitation. <clears throat> What's an invitation mean? It means you're invited, but only you can accept it of invitation of what expansion to experience a supernatural lifestyle that establishes a legendary legacy for us, and here's the key, for others. And you know, as God put that on my heart 17 years ago also, he gave me the scripture in Psalm 22, verses 30 and 31. It said, a posterity, which is a seed, will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And that's what people are going to say about you. Look at your neighbor and say, that's what people's going to say about us. People that are not yet born will be talking about your faith. People that are not yet born will be standing under your legacy. People that are not yet born will be come who they're called to be and assigned to be because of you. Somebody say, because of me. Because we accept the invitation and we say, yes, Lord, I accept the invitation for expansion. I accept the invitation to live a supernatural lifestyle, not just for this generation, but for generations to come. Can someone say amen? amen. God, the Word of God says in 10, Psalm 105, verses 8 through 10, Said he always stands by his covenant. When we did membership yesterday, it's not membership to a club. It's, member, it's a covenant membership, relationship, family. And that's what we have with God. He always stands by his covenant. The commitment he made to a thousand generations. Ooh. You know, biblical generations are 40 years. I know now we keep bumping it down to two, two and a half, whatever. But biblical generations are based on 40-year increments. To a thousand generations. This is the covenant he made with Abraham. And an oath he swore to Isaac, his son. He confirmed it to Jacob a decree and to a people in Israel. Of, then he goes on to say beyond a thousand, a never-ending covenant. Now God does things in threes, right? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, flesh, blood, and bone, spirit, soul, and body. And he does things in threes concerning generations. We see that he had the first generation of Abraham who went to a strange land. 
and accepted a word from the Lord to be his man of faith. Left his family, left everyone. Then we see in the second generation, the son he had believed for for 99 years. He and Sarah, they had, they had their Isaac, the second generation. And then we see the third generation, Jacob. And he was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, the third generation. Someone say the third generation. What's interesting with Jacob, the Bible, first of all, his name, uh, Jacob means deceiver or deceptor. And Jacob and his mother had schemed against Esau, his older brother, to get the blessing from his father, Isaac, who was blind at the time and elderly. Isaac lived under the covenant and the promises of his father, Abram, Abraham, the father of many nations. And he knew that once he laid hands and blessed, it was irrevocable. Hmm. Irrevocable. Somebody say irrevocable. Say God's blessing is irrevocable. When he blesses you, you're blessed. When he heals you, you're healed. When he delivers you, you're delivered. When he saves you, you're saved. When he fills you, you're filled. Say irrevocable. Blessings from daddy. Hmm. But Rebecca, that was her name, wasn't it? Isaac's wife, Rebecca. She was the one that was the main deceiver because Esau was a hunter, a gatherer. His dad loved him so much and favored him. Him being the oldest, he had the birthright to be in charge of everything. But while he was out hunting, she made a thing to cover Isaac, because he wasn't hairy like his older brother, to make him feel like he was hairy. And he went in and took him his favorite stew to receive a blessing from his father. And whenever Isaac put his hands on the furry thing that she covering she'd made, he said, oh, my son Esau, he brought my favorite stew, which Esau used to make for him. And he began to proclaim the blessings of God and the inheritance from his father Abraham to him and to many generations. Once Esau got home, he was so upset he was going to kill Jacob, upset at his mother. Before he could get home, she sent Jacob to her brother Laban, who was a crazy man in another area, another nation, and that's a whole other story, to run because she knew Esau would kill him. And when Esau found out that his dad had put the blessing on Isaac, he began to cry and scream. He was angry, and he went to his father and said, Father, Father, they deceived you. How can you bless them when you know I am the oldest, and I'm your oldest son, and I'm the one to be blessed? He said, I'm sorry, my son. Once the blessing is given, it can never be revoked. God can bless us even when we don't deserve it. Matter of fact, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve salvation. We deserve hell. But God. You see, you're, a lot of people will say, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. They have very little knowledge about the word of God, unfortunately. And I'm not putting you down. That's the same we were raised with. When you're born again, you're a child of God. You're no longer a sinner. Now, we're not saying you don't sin. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. That's what God gives us the opportunity to be restored and to repent and so on. The actual term, biblical term for death means to be separated from God forever. That's what death is. Every child is born in death. Even though it's alive, it's born separated from God because of Adam and Eve falling prey to disobey God to partake of the tree of knowledge of good of evil. Why did they take of the God, partake of that? They were deceived by Satan, who at one time was Lucifer. And he was in the garden, and he was crawling around. Well, actually, he wasn't crawling in the garden. Snakes could walk until they were cursed. <laughs> and he began to speak to them and tempted them, and they obeyed. And when they took the tree of knowledge of good and evil, why did God not want them to know that, to partake of that one tree? They had the tree of life. They had everything. Because he did not ever want them to experience evil. 
When you experience evil in your life, abuse, heartache, loss, suffering, by your own hand or someone else's hand, remember it's not God because Jesus said that he came to what? Save and set us free. Satan came but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life and life more abundantly or a blessing. All death and sin comes from the one sin of Adam and Eve. And God said once they did that, he began to lay out what would happen about how intimacy would be put between him and them and how Satan would bruise their feet and how they would have to work and toil to have their food and how childbirthing would become painful. Labor would hurt because of their sin. And he said from that point on, everyone would be what, born separated from God. And then he had to send the second Adam in 1 Corinthians and in Romans 5, it talks about Jesus being the second Adam to restore what the first Adam gave away. Not only to give you salvation, but to give you blessing. The Bible says it's only appointed but one time for man or woman to die. That means only one time were you appointed to be born separated from God. When you give your life to the Lord, you're what? Born again. What got born again? You're alive. Your soul, your mind, will, and emotions is alive. Your body's alive. Your spirit, the image and likeness of God is restored fully to you. You become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Righteousness is not holiness. Holiness is who God is. He is separate. He is other from evil, from sin, all those things. Because he's the one that already knew and had kicked Satan out of heaven and a third of the angels. He had already set the record straight and put Adam and Eve to restore everything. Because he said, we have created them in our own image, in our own likeness. He said, I have created man and in our own image, our own likeness, both male and female have we created them in our, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, own likeness. They shall go forth, what? They shall be in charge of the fish, the sea, the fowl, the air, and everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. They shall go forth and subdue, take charge, and take over. All the way back in Genesis 1, God was commissioning what man and woman would do as one. That they would go, what are they doing? Going forth to subdue. There was giants. There were evil in the land. They were protected in the Garden of Eden. He wanted to take the Garden of Eden with no evil, with power, with anointing, and the presence of God on a daily basis and overtake the remainder of the world where he had kicked Satan out of heaven and a third of the fallen angels running around like crazy giants and putting all kinds of evil in the earth where disease was rampant and germs had come forth, all of those things, and death had been established that would kill humans but not the spirit. And the image, the imago, the likeness are we are is spirit. That's who you really are. Your communion, your consciousness of God, the likeness of God. So what I want you to understand out of this is that when Jacob deceived his father, the blessing was irrevocable. Righteousness means position in God. Your position is no longer a sinner, a dead one. Your position is a son or a daughter. You're never going to be more blessed than you are on your best day, and you're never going to be more blessed than you are on your worst day because when you gave your life to Christ, He blessed you. You received His inheritance. The Bible calls him our elder brother, not just our Lord, but our elder brother. We have the same opportunities. 1 Peter 2, 24 says you're a chosen, selected generation, a royal priesthood, basilios, kingly in nature, 
What? To show forth the praises of the Lamb of God who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. His light is his splendor. His light is his holiness. His light is his glory. His light is his righteousness. Can someone say amen? Amen. Say, I'm blessed forever and ever and ever. And let Satan and every man that says I'm not be a liar because I am holy. Because I am a child of God. I am separated from an evil use for a holy use. To be in the image and likeness of my Father. Now we know our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, our decision-making resources still being renewed. Our body is, obviously, the Bible says, not the Bible, but science teaches us, I forget, at least one time a year or maybe more than that, every cell in your body is redone again. And that's where disease and stuff comes from, cancer, when cells are not redone properly because of whatever. That's why you age. It's because every year, I think it is, you get all new cells and they're not what they used to be. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. Don't know if that's exact. It's somewhere around that time. Some (laughs) biology major can tell me. Hallelujah. I'm just in the spirit right now. Praise God. This is an utterance from the Lord. This whole day is an utterance from the Lord. That you will stand up in your rightful righteousness, your rightful position as a child of God. Not as a servant, not as a slave, not as a friend, but as a son and a daughter of your Lord and Savior. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Later, Jacob became Israel, right? He had a name changed at Peniel, which is really the same location as Bethel. But then when he went away and found his wife and was running from his father-in-law Laban, coming back, didn't know if his brothers were going to kill him or what, he sent his family to the other side away from him and his servants because he knew if his brother found him, he might kill them and him. So in case he was going to die, he was camping at a place called Bethel where he put a memorial up before when he wrestled with God there, and that's where he got a name change and a limp. And then the Bible says while he was sleeping, all of a sudden he had a vision and the heavens opened up and a ladder came down and Gabriel and other angels came to and fro in front of him. That's the first place it's recorded in the Bible where that the presence of God was presence. That's what Bethel means. It means the house of God, the place of God, or the presence of God. And that's why we named this church Bethel place where the presence of God is and harvest a place to bring in souls. You're part of that legacy. You're part of the dream, the vision that God gave Stephanie and I back in 1998 before we left in 1999 to come to this place. Actually, 97 before we even came here in 98. That was we would be a church of the Gentiles, people that don't look the same, don't have the same education, don't have the same background. We look like a UK football or basketball game. Hopefully we look better, praise God. We know we need that. All you Louisville fans are laughing. I rebuke you now in Jesus' name. Especially Jay Dobin on the front row. How God would let a daggone Louisville fan be an armor bearer, I don't know. I'm gonna, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord about that. I want to talk to the Lord about that, praise God. But I still love him anyway. I'm still working on you Dolphin fans, Brian. I love y'all. But the the Dolphins, I'm just not. And I definitely, I just have to repent when I hear the name Chiefs. That's a cuss word, Kansas City. Let me get back out of the flesh and in the spirit. Hallelujah. Today, you're sitting in a, you drove up on a road that somebody believed for. You parked your car on pavement that someone sowed. Gave tithes and offerings for. You walked in the building with nice tile and air conditioning and heating. Someone believed for that. Many of you here did. You're sitting on a chair that someone believed for. Your feet sit on carpet that someone believed for. In the kingdom of God, everything comes through sowing and reaping. And when we sow, we get a harvest. And we get to reap. 
The Bible says when you're a child of God, you even get to reap where you have not sown to an extent until you have knowledge of revelation of what sowing is and then you're not going to reap where you did not sow. Hmm. Psalm 66, 5 says, Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for his people. Anybody ever participate in a miracle in this house? Wave at me. Come on, wave at me. You've seen a miracle in this house. Wave at me. You know that you know it was a miracle. Amen. If you've been here more than a month, you've seen one. And I, salvation's the greatest miracle, but I'm talking beyond that. God said that we're going to establish a legendary legacy. You've heard me say it, and you probably think I'm joking, but I'm not. I really believe we would buy Rupp Arena one day, and we would be holding services in it. Maybe we still will. I don't know. But God tamed me down about 10 years ago when I was arguing a little bit with him. I said, when we pulled up on this land and did our first television shoot while the weeds were up and the grass had just cut where we could stand and no road off of Nicholsville Road, just had to cross a ditch. Mark Keen was out there videoing us for the church and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord came up on me and said, from this spot, you will touch the world. And I said, Lord, you said from this spot, I'll touch the world. I'm not touching much of anything right now. Way less than what I ever dreamed I'd touch. He said, you'll still touch the world. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're first generation. But I blessed you like I did Abraham. And I blessed Stephanie so that you would raise up a generation of faith, debt-free, living a supernatural lifestyle to bring in children that are not yet born to my kingdom and all over the world, the name will be known of Bethel Harvest. Not because you deserve it, but because I promised it. Not because you earned it, but because I blessed you and you're crazy enough, you don't do everything I want you to do, but you do what I tell you to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. A legacy is what we cannot finish in our lifetime that requires someone else that we prepare to complete it or we inspire to complete it. A legendary legacy is a legacy that's never forgotten. They call people legends. They have legendary legacies in sports or education or whatever, medical field, science. You are part of a legacy and a prophetic word that God gave Steph and I 27 years ago. And that God gave Steph and I, oh goodness, 21, 22 years ago when we were standing out there across that ditch line before there was a road coming into this property. You're part of that legacy. If you choose to be, you are invited. It's invitational only. It's up to you. No guilt, nothing, it's up to you. To understand legacy, we got to realize that we've been commissioned, all of us, to pass on a legacy to generations. I've ministered a lot about fatherhood and spiritual fatherhood and being children of God and who Father God really is to us over the years. And I've talked to you about the importance of spiritual children. I look around this sanctuary and I see many spiritual sons and daughters. Pastor Mark, Elder Mark, he's a son. So is, you know, obviously his family, Katie and the children, sons and daughters, grandsons and daughters. Some of the family was ill. He was going to receive the offering this morning and couldn't do it. So another spiritual daughter on the last moment was asked and she got up. Did you think she did all right? I saw her markings all over her up here. I thought she was just going to take off and preach. She'll just let her do the service. It's all right with me. But she's spirit of our spirit, bone of our bone, and flesh of our flesh. Not in the natural flesh, but in the spirit, spiritual flesh. So is Travis. Many of you are the same. We're sons and daughters of God. 
that we have an opportunity to impart to others the life and legacy in us. Spiritual sons and daughters are someone who has an affinity or a passion to continue the legacy passed on to them from their spiritual father's and mother's heart, their spiritual parent's heart. Without sons and daughters in ministry, legacy can never continue or never happen. Malachi 4, 6 tells us about it, the last verse that got, the last chapter that was here in the Old Testament before 400 years of silence before we see the New Testament come on the scene. Malachi 4, 6, God said, and the Bible says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children. You notice he didn't say he would turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. The great transition is the current generation has to turn his heart toward the children that are not yet born. That's our duty. That's our legacy. We are to set them up for the assignment that God's put on our lives and will have on their lives. It's up to you and I with our own children and our grandchildren to what? To turn our hearts toward our children. I love what Megan said, like, well, you know, we've been doing this 16 years and I don't always understand everything I say, they say. But, you know, I love them and I'm learning. Well, what is that? She's constantly got her ear, her and Travis, how can I turn my heart toward their heart? How can I connect with their heart? How can I connect with them? And that's what is important for you and I to understand that we are connecting with generations that are not yet born, just like Abram did and become Abraham and became a father of many nations. We have the opportunity to be spiritual parents of children that are not yet born and affect from this spot multiple generations till the Lord comes. Well, I've been watching the news. That's your problem. Sorry you're in fear and anxiety and anxious. I can lay hands on you later, but don't go home and watch the news. Just get cliff notes, see what's going on. Can't believe any of them. Just get all three sides. and Sometimes there's 12 sides. Just kind of average it out in the middle. It's somewhere in there. Hallelujah. I live a lot better since I stopped watching Fox and MSNBC and all the rest of it. CBS, NBC, and The View. If you watch The View, you must love devils. That's all I can say. You, 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 just must, you must love walking through hell if you watch those crazy people on the view. I'm just telling you. Well, pastor, you offended me. Well, you're probably not a spiritual child of mine. Praise God. You need a spiritual spanking if you're watching that junk. Hallelujah. Man, he's getting, when the prophetic gets on me, I'm just telling you. I get on you. Hallelujah. I'm trying to stay in the spirit. I'm about to get in the flesh. I just, I just hate how people deceive God's children. Amen. Amen. Where was I before I got in the flesh? Huh? Anybody know? Must not have been in the spirit much then. Oh, yeah. So, so our duty is to set up with our own children and grandchildren and turn our hearts toward them and help them be who God called them to be. You know, when you're first generation, you work it, you dig it, you bleed, you stand for it. At the end of your life, it's looking pretty good and you're setting up your kids and your grandkids and they get to just jump right in on it. You know, you got some people said, well, don't look for my inheritance. I bought this car. You know what I mean? I I ain't leave no inheritance. Well, then you're worse than the infidel is what the Bible says. The Bible says if you don't leave a An inheritance for your children and your children's children, you're worse than an infidel. What's an infidel? One who does not know God. Worse than. Not as bad. Because you know the truth. And you know what you're supposed to do. It's one of the reasons I talked about last week. Steph and I are, some people would call it downsizing. We're expanding. We're selling our house. We're moving into a property we've been renovating to sell. We're going to live in it. We're going from 3,800 square feet to 2,300 square feet. Somebody say, well, I'd like to have a place 2,300 square feet. Well, come out of a 3,800 foot square house and see how you feel. You better know it's God if you want to stay married. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
And I wasn't brave enough to mention it but a time or two, and I left it alone. And then God spoke to Stephanie, and she got come home, and I thought she was mad. Okay, this is what the Lord told me. I said, okay, now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We're going to sell this house. We're going to expand. We'll owe no man nothing but to love him, and we can bless generations. That's a woman of God right there. I said, that's a woman of God. Hallelujah. You know, our desire is not just, you know, the whole purpose of Legendary Legacy this, this next few years, maybe a year, is we're opening up for you. I'll get into the details a little later that we're going to have Legendary Seed Sunday once a month, one, the first month, Sunday of every month. And that's where everything above your regular giving, and we got a place where you can classify that, that it is that goes toward the debt of the building, not electric, not meant the debt of the building. We owe 3.5, which is not bad from 7.8, right? And we're in a good place, good church in a good place. It's like, oh, Lord, what, what's going on? No, everything's good. Just getting ready to get gooder, that's all. And then the Lord, you know, you go on these fasts, you know, and Zach, you know, how you go on a fast. You're like, okay, Lord, I, well, I went on a fast. I was believing for a lot of stuff. Now I'm trying to believe where I can get rid of stuff so I can move into something smaller. But that's God, right? But we're so excited about it because it's really expanding. And who knows? We might live there a year or 10. I don't know. But I do know this. Whatever it is, it's going to be great. And God might just give us a bigger, newer house and we don't even pay for it. I don't know. I'm not concerned about it. I'm not nervous. But if we're going to lead you to live a legendary lifestyle, we got to at least attempt it. And that's the best way we know how. Now, the vision is not just for the church to get rid of paying interest to a bank. It's to get you to be debt free. Our heart, we're not going to condemn you or nothing. We're just going to lead and encourage you. Shed things. Get yourself debt free. Oh, no man, nothing. All of a sudden, your salary is worth 100 times what it was before when you don't owe any debt. At least 70% more than. So our heart is that you just get on a journey with us. Start where you're at. Amen. Oh, I'm a heavy meddling preacher. Meddling on. Luke 1, 17 says he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. How can we make ready if we're not prepared? If we want seed or children that are not yet born to be prepared, how are we going to prepare them when we don't know what preparation it is? It's what I loved about Abraham. No matter how crazy it was or Sarah or whoever got on him, you know, he just kept walking. He made some mistakes. You know, hey, God, we get that. And the firstborn there that we got all the other crazy stuff from. But he repented and God gave him his Isaac. So you're going to make mistakes. But if you're quick to repent, keep yourself humble as best you can before the Lord, he's going to increase the blessing on your life. Can somebody say amen? amen? And it's up to us to prepare. I love how Malachi gives both sides, the prophet Malachi, of the coin that's important for you and I to turn our hearts toward our children. If we want them to love what we love, we got to love what they love. If we want them to know what we know, we got to do our best to know what they know and enjoy the journey with them. But when you're talking about children that are not yet born for multiple generations, man, that's a whole other side of the coin. That is a totally out of your hands but for the blessing and the favor of God. But God told Abraham that. We're, we're his children. We're under the seed of Abraham. Why can't we have the same anointing? Some of you are going to go into cattle business and own cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. We cannot Discover. Remember I told you this year was about also dis- many of us discovering the legacy we're going to have, right? We have an ideal, but to get clarity. Well, if you want to get clarity on your legacy as a child of God, you must understand family. You must 
understand family. That's the heart of all scripture from God. The primal dream, the primal dream of God was to establish a family in the earth that he could fellowship with. Sons and daughters who would reciprocate his love and spirit in the earth throughout all generations. He wants his name, his love, his spirit reciprocated throughout eternity on this earth. Well, you know, I don't think this earth's going to be here in 10 years. Well, you don't know much about scripture. I don't know. Do anybody believe that the bride of Christ is without spot or blemish right now? The church? When it gets there, then you can start talking about the second coming of the Lord. People can scare you if they want to, but, and if I'm wrong, I'll just go to heaven. That's okay. Just, my, just like I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God spoke, bang, there it was. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ephesians 1, 5, I love it out of the Rothlam translation. It says, in love, marking us out beforehand unto sonship. God, in love, marking us out beforehand in sonship. You know, one of the definitions for anointing is to mark or target, to smear, to rub, all that. But also it means to target or to mark. In other words, anointing us beforehand unto sonship, what through Jesus Christ unto himself, God marked us, anointed us out for the position, which is your righteousness, position and place of sons and daughters in his family. What's amazing with God, he could have established a thousand generations with just a word when he created the worlds and the universe and the heavens and people, but he didn't. He created a man, and then out of the man, he took a rib and created a woman. Adam got what he asked for, amen. And then what happened? How's it procreated through a man and a woman, right? Easy science. That's why a man leaves his parents to marry a woman. <laughs> anyway, whoa, man, hallelujah. I told you I'm a heavy meddling preacher today. Nothing, you know, anyway, I love everybody. Praise God, love everybody. Now, instead, he created one man, one woman, and permitted them to be father and mother of his children father and mother of his children. At the very beginning, he took humanity into partnership with himself and let us give birth to his joy, the apple of his eye, to his heart. And this shows his eternal responsibility to you and I, but also the eternal responsibility you and I have to every seed that comes from our loins and every spiritual seed that comes from our spiritual life with God. God chose the framework of family to establish his word in the earth. Family is at his heart, what makes his heart beat. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good at all, especially to those who are the household of faith. You see, we have in the church, the body of Christ, denominations. That just doesn't even sound right. That means to divide. Denomination. That's a de so we divide people up into homogeneous units, black churches, white churches, Asian churches, you know, Pentecostal, non-Pentecostal, over-the-top Pentecostal, not quite Pentecostal, little Baptist, a lot of Baptist, old Baptist, young Baptist, new Baptist, you know, sovereign Baptist, free will Baptist. I mean, Baptist is like, you know, the plants out here. There's a Baptist for everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not putting Baptist down. That's great heritage. I'm Nazarene, great heritage. But God didn't say stop just learning sanctification. He said go on and learn everything. He didn't just tell the Baptists to stop at getting people saved and don't smoke as much as you used to. No, Baptists, we're supposed to be like John the Baptist, but then we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? And we're supposed to be getting people baptized in his name. It doesn't matter if you're Methodist or whatever. You know, you know I'm, I studied Wesleyan in college. I got my master's at Divinity. It's on my walls in the back somewhere. I don't keep it out front, I don't think. They put it up a couple years ago. I had it in a box. I have my master's of Divinity. Hallelujah. 
And the one thing that John Wesley said, my, my only desire with the great move of God, and, and I love Methodist, my wife's Methodist, right? Is that this movement does not become a method or a form. And somebody named it Methodist. Hallelujah. Not putting Methodist down. Now, don't get all crazy on me. I love Methodists. Love everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Most holiness people don't have a clue what holiness is. Boy, I'm really meddling now. I'm making everybody mad. I'm just hitting everybody. <laughs> Some think it's a hole in their shoes, you know. Some think it's ultra, non-sin, whatever. But if you're judging, you're sinning. If you're mean to people, you're sinning. If you're angry at people because they get to do things you can't do and they still get to go to heaven, that's sin. Praise God. I saw if I want to hit everybody, just hit everybody. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let me get out here alive, Lord. That's why Jay is my armor bearer. I got my big armor bearer over there. He'll protect me and Rick, even though he's a Louisville fan. God bless him. Hell, I love him. Hallelujah. If I can love a Louisville fan, I can love anybody. No, I'm just kidding. I do like Louisville. They're my second favorite team. So, it's all about the household of faith or what a family of faith. We call it around here the family of choice, right? Yes. God gave us a word when preparing to purchase this property that we're to pass on this legacy of faith, a generation full of faith doing supernatural exploits with God, owing no man nothing but to love him. And God started dealing with me about six months before two streams and I started getting nervous. I'm like, God, everything's going good. I don't want to start pressuring people for money and asking people for money. And he said, well, what do you mean? I gave the greatest seed of all, my son. It don't hurt people to sow a seed. That's what, the only way I can bless them is if they sow a seed. You need to get them blessed. I said, yeah, but everything's so good and everybody's in love and it's all sweet at Bethel and it's fun and we just praise and worship and people are healed and saved. But he says, time to put a demand on the anointing. And I'm not doing it in a pressure way. Look, it's an invitation. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. And we're not going to be up here every service talking about a bunch of money either. I'm not even telling you what to give. That's between you and God. Ah, uh, man, am I making any sense right now? Hallelujah. I need to look that way. Am I, baby? Am I okay? Or am I a little out there? Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 19, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We're part of the family of God. Can you say amen to that? Christianity is more than doing things for God. Christianity is about being a child of God. My parents, when they gave birth to me and my other siblings, they didn't give birth to have a friend a servant or a slave. They wanted children. When God gave his son Jesus, Jesus came to this earth by free will and choice. He didn't come to, yeah, it talks about being servants and being a friend of God. There's cute songs about it. But that's a downgrade from what you really are. You're a child of God. You're family. And that makes you and I family. Amen. You may not like it, but you are if you're saved. Hallelujah. John 16, 27 expresses, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. That's Jesus talking to you and I. He wants you to know that daddy loves you. The word Abba is translated Papa or Dada or Daddy. He's not just God. He's not just Lord and Savior. He's all that, but he's also Daddy. And you may not have never known your father. Maybe you're, my dad died when I was three months old. I had a stepfather, a wonderful man for a few years, killed in a coal mine accident. Never really knew what a father figure was that much other than what he showed me. He did a good job of what time he had. But I've learned it walking this journey with Daddy God. It took me over 20 years to preach this gospel before I got a revelation. He's more than Lord and Savior. That he's Daddy. And that's something I've been trying for the last 15 years to get in you. Fatherhoods begin from the great Father God. Motherhood and fatherhood begin 
from the great Father God. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole, W-H-O-L-E, family in heaven and earth is named. The Greek word for family is fatherhood. Talk about procreation. Fatherhood is the instinct of instinct of creation was given by God. All fatherhood, love in the human race comes from the heart of our Father God. The Bible calls you living stones. I'm not going to talk about that. First Peter two five. So let me talk about this for just a moment. Travis, can you put up last week's message, a link to YouTube? Sometimes you get on YouTube and it has two or three different Bethel things. But I don't, if you want to hear the real heart of what we're doing this year, just go and watch this message on YouTube I preached last week that I really taught from my heart. But God said we're to establish legendary seed Sundays as offerings. It's you bring what you want. Basically what we're going to be doing is throughout now to November, everything you give toward Legendary Sunday is being put back. And then the goal is that it will be more than a month's income obviously will be there. But everything you give from now to then still counts towards your November seed. But we're taking November as the Legendary Sowing Month. We're gonna, it's Legendary Seed Month. So we're going to go from Legendary Seed Day Sunday and everything in November that comes in, I'll have to get along with God. He might say above the tithe on that because that's not a seed. So we'll have to see. But everything that comes seed-wise, whatever, goes toward the debt of the, the building because that's the first thing God said, get rid of. Now, we're going to be taking seed offerings. We're going to be, you know, receiving blessing. We still do our food bank, and we still do other things and ministries and outreach ministries, and we have Prophet Trout next week. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to be here for that Sunday morning and Sunday night. But it all go toward all of November. It's crazy. It's kind of like 12, 13 years ago when God told us, put on our heart, convicted us about sowing a Sunday, right, for, for the city. And now we did, what, two this year or three? We do two every year now where we take entire Sunday service, we gather together, we have about six or seven projects, and we just go sow the whole Sunday morning into our city, right? That takes faith because, you know, usually people don't give when they're not sitting here. And they're not giving a lot of times. Sometimes some people do with push pay, but most of the time, it's, put it, it's just 20 or 30% of what it normally is. We didn't know if it'd be zero. We didn't, that what God said, we had to build up to where the church was healthy enough to take that step of faith because we don't be foolish. And now we're doing it two times a year. I don't know of any other church in this area doing that. Do you take a full Sunday morning and we come here and pray, gather, and go do work in the, for the city? I'd give God a shout of praise. I'd, I'd join a church like that. <laughs> and now God's saying, Take a month of your income and sow it toward the debt of the loan on the building. And so we're going to be doing that all month. Now, what I want you to understand is the seed, and I told you this before I even realized we'd totally do this, that you're sowing this year is multi-generational. Anything you sow, think about the blessing that God has on. Think of how blessed Abraham was and his family and generations after. Even Jewish people today, people don't understand how wealthy Jewish people, it's the blessing. Whether they serve God or not, the blessing's still on them. And I'm just telling you, get your heart right. You do what God tells you to do. But I'm just telling you, every penny, every nickel, every dime, every dollar, you do, it is going to have a multi-generational blessing on it. Because the Bible says when we give, God shall what? give back to us in our bosoms through other people, shaken, pressed down, and running over, shall God give to us. God will find ways to get stuff into your hands you never even believed for. Stuff you're, you're, I believe there's some of you been saving for your dream card. You're going to sow the finances. And I just believe it. I believe people are so down payments. I believe people, it's just, I mean, if God said what he said to us, I can only imagine what he's going to say to some of you. It's up to you to obey him. I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm telling you, you don't have to give anything. 
God's God. I'm not, and you ain't, so it don't matter. Amen. I have nothing but to love you. That's it. Nothing but to love you. But those that are spiritual children hear this, and they know. Everybody else, join in if you want to. Spiritual sons and daughters will be all over this thing. I don't have to prod it, pump it. I just, this is what God told me. And he's confirmed it with staff. He's confirmed it with other men and women in this house. We talked through with, not just staff or Elder Mark, but others. Because I just want to make sure that everybody felt I was hearing clearly from God. Because you got to, you got to, when God gives you a word, you don't just, oh, that's it. You got to put it in front of wise counsel and get feedback. Amen. And to see, then you may have to pray again. But that's what the Lord said. So your opportunity to sow is whenever you want to because actually the first designated Sunday for the church is the first Sunday in March, March 3rd. So that's your opportunity to sow. Some have already started sowing. But on Push Pay It Has, Legendary Seed Sunday or Legendary Seed, you can anytime you can sow toward that. My advice is, Set a number you know you're comfortable with doing by the end of November that you feel God's putting here. And then set another number that's going to take crazy faith to do. And you just let God lead you and help you. And then whatever you're sowing is going to be counted toward that November deal. And by the end of November, that's it. And then we'll just be praying about next year. But I'm just, I can't. Imagine in my own mind the testimonies we're going to get back from you guys. And once the building's paid for, God said, keep doing it. I want, it, I want always a Sunday to be designated as Seed Sunday just so people learn and grow. Many of you have been here, you understand what Seed is. But a lot of people new don't understand. They don't know. But if we keep doing it in repetition, it's going to set it up for generations. Can you imagine two generations from now what November is going to be? See, I don't think like this November. I'm, I'm thinking like the next generation November and the next generation November. I'm, I'm not thinking about this first seed Sunday. I'm thinking about two, three, four generations. They might buy cities. Who knows? Second generation might buy rubber. I don't know. Maybe we will. Who knows? I'm going to limit God. Say expansion. Amen. 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 Well, do you still love me? <laughs> yeah, I'm cheering for San Francisco too because they play in the Chiefs. That's all. <laughs> I love CJ. He's good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Boy, when I was younger, I'd be all like a mosquito on a hot rock, boy, bouncing around, shouting and sweating at you what God told me. Now I'm just like, hey, this is what God said. It's up to you. My heart is you do what he says. It's your business. Break my heart if you don't because I love you so much. I don't want to see you miss it. But again, it's up to you. You're going to start hearing all those testimonies and go, woo, I should have done that. You wait. You're going to hear. I mean, I look at the garrisons, how God's blessed them financially, just amazingly how he's blessed them. But they've always been, even whenever they were, company was cut down and sold, and man, they were just trying to make it through to keep their kids in the Christian school and all that. They just kept tithing and giving, tithing and giving. And you know what? They don't have to worry about that stuff now. God's blessed them abundantly. Why? Because they were obedient to do what God asked them to do. And there's a hundred or more in this families that's like that in this church and you know you just need to watch people watch their lives and see how God blesses them ask them about it. ask people about it they don't yeah one one year even if they went out to eat the kids and everybody they only drank water they would not drink a soft drink because they couldn't afford it they to keep their kids at Christian school and pay the electric bill that's what they had to do but you know what they kept tithing and they kept sewing and it, that only lasts a year or two and after that they ain't worried about that no more and it didn't just all come in a windfall. It's just been a process. And God's given us a family process, a legacy together that's going to go through generations. Anybody ready to make legendary legacy together? Are you ready? Stand up and give God a shout of praise if you're ready for a legendary legacy. Hallelujah. While you're standing, I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to ask those that, 
you're far away from God or you've never been a believer, and you say, I want to I wanna have Jesus in my heart. I want to be a child of God. If that's you on a count of three, raise your hand. I want to pray for you just right where you are. You online, we'll pray for you as well. I'm going to count to three and you say, man, I just want to come home to the Lord or I want to give my life to God for the first time. If that's you, I'm going to count to three, pray for you right where you are right now. God is here and he is ready to move. One, two, three. Just raise your hand up high. Thank you back there for that hand, sir. Other hands. That gentleman, thank you, sir, for that hand. There's two men right there. There's got to be some others. If those two men raise their hands to be saved. Anybody else? Give God a shout for these two gentlemen that want to give their life to Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all pray this prayer with them, and you guys pray this well, and the prayer team will get with you. Now say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I believe his blood atones my sin. I repent of sin. I ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my heart and my Savior. I thank you, Father, that I am blood-bought. I am born again in Jesus' name. Give God a shout of praise for those two gentlemen right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.